<laughs> All right, we're going to kind of go through this speech by speech. We'll do the best we can to kind of give you a summary of issues that are going on here. The first affirmative constructive, I think, starts off with a little bit of organization. Uh, the opening point talks about some of the risks of animals being in zoos. I, I think that you need a clearer structure when you're presenting this. You do have some secondary points that you're talking about. You talk about zoocosis, you talk about preventing death, uh, and, you, and you argue that they aren't educated. There's not really an inherency argument that talks about what the uh, problems with zoos are. It's all just the significance claim that's being presented. Why it is that zoos are inherently going to create zoocosis or uh, inherently create premature death, that's not really discussed. You've got a nice example that you present to, to talk about some of the problems that uh, animals have in zoos, but uh, one's kind of hypothetical, that's the polar bear thing, and the other is uh, about the, um, the gorilla, and I'm going, okay, so where's the data you know, that says that the zoo that caused this problem with the gorilla? I, I think your, your quote needs to be a little bit more direct in that situation. Um, there's a, there's a disease argument that you start off with, and it sounds to me like your argument isn't about disease that animals can get in zoos. It's more like uh, that humans are going to get diseases from animals that are contained in zoos. And I didn't hear any evidence other than, you know, that it's possible to get salmonella or to get uh, some of these other things that are being talked about. But do we have any cases of people who've gotten sick from going to the petting zoo or from encountering reptiles at the zoo or that there's been some outbreak of some horrifying disease in a locality because the zoo brought in some exotic animal? I, I think that that point isn't getting you anything. It, it feels a little bit like a waste of time in the argument. Uh, so you've got some significance claims structured. They're okay. Uh, there's an argument there at the end that says that, that the zoos are not really educational. I think there's a value argument to be developed that says, look, we're exploiting animals, and the primary reason that we're exploiting them is for entertainment purposes, and that that's wrong. Make that argument. Don't be shy about saying that. It's wrong just to use the animals for the purpose of entertainment. Now, I think you kind of you know, may make this uh, kind of visual reference to it. You know, imagine if you were just in your house and uh, in your room and it was all windows and people are peeking in on you while you're doing that. There's a little bit of that argument there, uh, but I think that it's you know, very speculative. There's got to be some criteria that suggests that this is wrong. Uh, I can't tell. Both sides seem to be arguing that animals have rights. So are the zoos providing them with their rights or are they taking away their rights? Somebody needs to take a position on this. It just gets confusing throughout the whole debate what it is you're talking about here. I, that, that's, and part of that is that the first affirmative doesn't really discuss the rights issue in, in the distinctive way that it needs to be presented as a significance claim. Um, I thought the discussion of digitalized zoos is an alternative, a way of kids learning. That's an attempt to kind of provide a, a solvency argument that talks about those points. That's fine. Uh, we go a little bit off the rails in the first negative constructive because we information is being very randomly discussed. Uh, so what structure there was in the first affirmative mostly gets ignored, and we talk about a couple of random issues. There's a discussion about the uh, disease issue, for instance, uh, but um, it doesn't seem to go anywhere. Uh, the zoocosis thing, there's an answer there, and the only answer is, you know, that animals have smaller brains. So what does that mean, that they have smaller brains? Uh, you present an education argument, which is like the, the first of your major arguments, but that was the last thing that the affirmative talked about, so why you didn't save it to talk about in that situation, I don't know. It seems like it's a completely separate claim not connected to the disease issue, not connected to zoocosis, not preventing connected to preventing deaths, it's a little bit about the education issue. So let's, let's drop it down there and present it when you are talking about the education issue. This is the one place where I thought there was good clash during the debate uh, in the first couple of references to it, and then afterwards it goes nowhere. Um, you've got a statistic that says that the uh, people who visit the zoos rate their educational experience very highly. 
Uh, when the affirmative comes back, uh, there's an argument that suggests that uh, people are not really getting as much out of the zoo experience as they ought to, and you've got a statistical comparison that you're making as well. Uh, and the difference, the difference appears to be whether or not they are being led on their zoo experience or whether the teachers are having to do this. I think that there's an interesting point to be made there. Uh, how, what is the zoo experience like? This is the inherency argument. How do people visit zoos? Do they just randomly show up and walk around and look at the animals and leave? Or do kids, when kids go with their classes, do they go to the zoo? Is there a particular tour? Are they, give, are they led by a... Uh, uh, an expert on animals, or do their, does their teacher just lead them around? This is kind of what you're arguing that says that we don't use the zoos the proper way. That's what your inherency argument is, that there's something wrong with the way the zoos are utilized, and it needs to be explained a little bit more clearly. They've got an argument that says that people who go to zoos feel pretty satisfied that they've learned something, and uh, your argument is that they aren't really learning anything, or they'd learn more effectively if they were led by a, uh, uh, a guide, and where's the proof that there aren't any guys, that they don't get this kind of service, that the educational process doesn't reflect those sorts of things. I think that's where there could be some clash on this issue of education, but it just doesn't get uh, developed very clearly. And then uh, we get going on PETA, and I, you know, I, I think that that becomes a side issue that doesn't mean anything. Uh, you guys keep coming back to it like it's the key issue in the debate, and I don't know why. Uh, anybody gives a damn about it. Uh, it just seems like you are wasting your energy on that particular point. Uh, the, I thought that you had kind of some workability arguments, Ian, that talks about, you know, are these zoos, are these digital things going to work? You know, and you kind of make fun of, you know, elephant error 404, you know, and it's going to stop functioning. I think, I think there's a good press to be made that says the technology isn't this way. It's not... You know, there's a big, I think you want to come back to that argument. There's a big difference between seeing an animal live and seeing a virtual reality version of the animal. If you think you understand lions and tigers and bears because you've seen the Jungle Book, there is a problem that's going on here. You don't understand animals at all, and you don't have any sense of what they're like just because you've seen them in 3D up on the movie screen. That there's a difference in those particular issues. The idea that, well, if, what if it's not working that day? Well, what if the animals don't come out that day? that the kids visit. I, I mean, both situations are going to run into problems. You don't tell us why your problem is any worse than the problem that they're talking about in this situation. So it's not really uh, a critical issue, just it's something to say. Now, I think you do have a good argument that you introduce. It probably should be a second negative argument. It does get to discussed by the second negative also, and that's on the conservation issue. This is basically one of the advantages that zoos provide is that they are protecting the conservation process. And you've got some information here that talks about the number of animals, the percentage, you know, that 21% uh, of the mammals in the world are threatened, 12% of the amphibians are threatened, or 12% of the birds are threatened, 33% of the amphibians are threatened. And uh, that's, they're threatened not because they're in zoos, they're threatened because they're not in zoos. That's the argument that you want to be making. Uh, they say, let's have animals in the wild. The problem is the wild is a dangerous place because the environment is going to hell in a handbasket, because there are predators out there, because there are people who abuse the process out there. And the only way that we're going to maintain these animals and prevent them from disappearing off the face of the earth is if we conserve them, and zoos do that kind of conservation. That's the argument that you want to be making. And I think that you are on the brink of making that argument, but then you just kind of get sidetracked onto some things. Um, you know, it, it, you know the, the idea of conserving animals, I think, is an important one. There's a good quote. I'm trying to remember if it's... Um, I think it was in the second negative that talks about how seeing the animals live is the thing that makes the difference, that people care about it because they relate to it. They get a sense of what's going on. That's what inspires them. Was that in the second negative? Yeah. You know, that sort of thing. That's, that should be the link argument in the disadvantage. It says people care about conserving animals because they see animals and they relate to them and they perceive them differently when they encounter them in real life. You see a picture, you see a virtual reality presentation, you feel empathy for it. You don't feel empathy for the electronic gorilla. You know, but when you see a gorilla with a baby taking care of it, you know, you respond to it. Now, they say that they don't take care of the babies. That's an isolated case 
Uh, I don't know that, and I don't know that that's a result of you know the way the zoo works, or if it's you know, are there other gorillas that have been that way? Maybe we just have one stupid gorilla. You know, I, we don't know that. Uh, we don't. It's an interesting incident. It's like they're making a lot of inferences, by the way, off of these particular cases. So we've got one gorilla that doesn't feed its baby, and that means that captive gorilla breeding is a failure. I, I don't know how you get to that issue. Uh, we've got, uh, by the way, no s reference to it, except that they assert this. Orca's trying to kill themselves, and I, I, the evidence on that was, uh, you know, they scraped their chins. And I'm not exactly sure that that's an attempt to kill yourself, you know. How some psychologist inferred that the animal's trying to do itself in because it's scraping its chin in the aquarium that it's kept in. That seems to me to be a big inference that's going on there. And that they uh, butchered a giraffe in a zoo in Germany because they had too many of them. Uh, you know, is that really descriptive of zoos around the world? Well, that's what the affirmative wants to tell you. You know, they've got these cases and they're making these inferences. I don't, you know, I think the negative ought to be arguing that this is not representative of what zoos are like. People go to zoos to see the animals, to learn about them, to relate to them. The zoos take the best care of their animals that they can. They display them in the most natural positions that they can. Now, is the territory too small sometimes? I can empathize with the animals, you know, let's face it, you know, if you're an elephant and you're used to ranging over 30 or 40 miles a day looking for food and, you know, getting that kind of exercise and basically you've got a small circle to walk around in, I could see why that would make you crazy, you know, uh, and I think that you kind of draw this uh, parallel behavior to people, uh, and I think people will identify with that emotional appeal that you're talking about. I think you need a little bit more information on it. You know, that the animals are injuring themselves. That You've got some statistic that says elephants live one third as long. I, I know that you presented this information. I don't remember where it came from, and I don't know what the data is on this, so I think you ought to be a little bit clearer about that. You know, I, I don't, you know, I, I I don't doubt that you've got the information, I just didn't get cited very clearly in the debate. Uh, so that's one of the things that you want to point out, is that look, they claim that they care about animals, but animals that are kept in captivity have a variety of problems. These are the problems that they have, and if you care about animals, you shouldn't want that to happen. If you want to preserve animals and conserve them, then we should be doing something different to conserve them, and that is uh, putting them in nature preserves so where they'll be protected from these kinds of issues. And that's kind of what we think that they ought to be doing, and that those would be effective at uh, doing the breeding kinds of things. I, I don't know. The, there was a sidetrack issue on the breeding issue at one point where you are suggesting that animals are being tortured because they're being bred, and that, that sounded a little weird to me. Uh, you guys have a good follow-up on this argument that, with the example of condors and the arnix and uh, the black-footed ferret as examples. I think that that should be something that you should be pounding on. Without zoos, we wouldn't have this animal anymore. Without zoos, this animal would be extinct. Without zoos, these animals would not be extinct. And here are three examples that show that this works. And now, the, you know, do we have anything that shows nature preserves conserve animals, restore them, protect them from being extinct? What's the, ad, what's the evidence that comes from the affirmative on those issues? That's the kind of challenge that I think you guys ought to be presenting on this issue. Uh, you get sidetracked on some other points. It's a little confusing sometimes. All right. Uh, we, I got off a little on a couple of tangents there. Uh, Bree, on the second affirmative, You should be following the structure of your partner a lot more. All right, so there's an affirmative case there. Let's, let's follow the arguments. We started with talking about diseases. We've got an argument about uh, premature death. We've got an argument about um, its failure to educate. So let's follow those arguments. Now, we said that they get diseases. What is the negative argument about this particular point? They say, well, they, animals have diseases in the wild, too. But your argument isn't about that animals get the diseases and they die. Your argument is about people getting diseases from the animals that they come in contact with at the zoos. That's the way you present it. By the way, this would be a good time to introduce some of that information about uh, who got 
salmonella from visiting the zoo or who got uh, dengue fever or whatever the heck it is that you think that they're going to get from encountering animals in the zoos. I didn't hear any of that, so I think that that's a little bit problematic. Like I said, I think the disease argument doesn't go anywhere for you. Uh, it seems to me like it's more likely to be about the longevity in the zoos that you ought to be talking about. Uh, the argument about um, you know preventative death, I think you did have some information on that. I, the education argument, you you have a tendency to use the evidence instead of making the claim and then using the evidence to support it. You kind of present the evidence and 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 think that that's making the argument, and uh, it can, but it, it's it's uh, probably not as effective a way of doing it. So you've got this uh, one statistic that you present in response to the. Uh, St. Louis Zoo experiment uh, that, the, uh, for, that the negative's talking about, and I thought that that was a good response. It says only a third of the uh, kids get a valuable experience, and mostly that's because they're being led by their teachers instead of the uh, experts in those situations. And, but even if we gave them the credit, 62% learn more with the uh, teachers, well, that still suggests that uh, almost 40% don't get jacked from visiting the zoos, that they aren't learning anything as a consequence. So, you know, I, I think you can make this argument that says they could do, they could experience all of these things in another format and be just as well informed or even better informed. And in fact, if it's interactive, they'd learn even more. I don't know if you did. You guys have any data that talked about how much more effective interactive education is? Well, that would have been the place to put it. All right. All right. Let's see. You know, and then and then we got to like I said the the giraffe kill thing that's on the premature death stuff. Um, it's it's not a bad example to use, but it's an awfully big inference to make that that's you know typical or uh, you know, is is widely descriptive of of what goes on in zoos. Um, and then there are a whole bunch of arguments that the uh, affirm, excuse me that the negative made that you didn't talk about in your speech. The whole conservation argument gets ignored. The research argument, which wasn't very well developed, uh, gets ignored. And then there's another conservation argument. This is you know Ian's not being very well organized. You know it's like four different times you're making the same kind of argument instead of grouping it together and building it into an argument. It just is being randomized, and I think that that's a problem, uh, a very consistent problem. So we got you know. Uh, Conservation, research, conservation, research in you know four different places here, uh, instead of building into a single argument. And then of course we get our PETA discussion, which I don't know what the heck that gets us. In. All right, Ozzy, I don't know about your arguments, but you're very passionate when you're speaking. Uh, you get really involved in what you're talking about, but I think your arguments need to be a little bit more developed and structured. Um, you make an argument, for instance, about income that the zoos bring in and the number of people who are employed in zoos. All right, so there's, there's a disadvantage. If we get rid of zoos, there's going to be some economic consequences to it. So states and cities are going to lose revenue and people are going to be unemployed. That's a disadvantage. That's fine. And that's the last time we ever hear about it. What did the affirmative say about it when they got up to speak? They said like they said that the okay so they were like the the money doesn't go directly to the government and it, they're spending more time more money on yeah the closest thing they have to an argument is that you still have costs that you have to spend to run the zoos but that's not about tax revenue and that doesn't address the issue of 152,000 people who are now out of a job and I assume that's in the United States. All right, so if we're talking about getting rid of zoos in the U.S., 152,000 people out of a job, well, you never say anything about that again. They don't talk about it, and you don't talk about it again. And how, at the end of the debate, how am I supposed to use this information? You, know, you should come back to it. You need to say, I made this argument. Their an they didn't answer the argument about unemployment at all, and their answer on the revenues is simply that there are costs to the zoos. But those costs are already, you know, those don't include the profits and the tax revenue that's generated. That's completely separate. You know, and, uh, you know, 
I, you know, you didn't really have a big impact on it, I, I, but at least you had made an argument about it. But then you never talk about it again. It's like it, it was just something I thought of at one point to fill a minute of speaking time, and it's not really an argument that I give a damn about and want to speak about ever again. And so it just kind of sits there and gets ignored. And I think that's problematic. Uh, you come back to, you know, you kind of challenge the idea of these interactive uh, or virtual reality things where you, and you kind of talk about uh, there's no Jurassic Park and you know, that kind of stuff. Okay. This is where I think your argument comes down to, is there a difference between learning about animals from seeing them in real life versus learning about animals from a virtual reality experience or reading about them or seeing pictures of them, that sort of thing. The whole link to your <coughs> argument on education has to be based on this idea of first-hand experience, that people relate to the animals differently, they care about it uh, differently. Uh, they say, oh, you don't learn anything about it, they just see the animals. They, uh, I won't say that they say you don't learn anything, you learn what size and shape and you know, stuff like that, you know, how they carry themselves, there's a little bit, that's what your argument was, Alexis, and, you know, that seems like it's uh, a good response. I, your response needs to be, and that matters. You know, there's a, there's a difference. You, if you tell a kid, you know, a tiger can be up to six feet long and weigh 500 pounds, and people go, okay, well. But when you see a six-foot tiger, and you see that 500 pounds moving on its feet, you relate to it in a completely different way and suddenly you care about it. And that's why zoos matter, because people care about animals. Now, it's not just an object that is for examination under a microscope, it's something that they relate to and feel empathy for and it matters to them, which is, I think, another tie-in to their conservation argument. You're, get, you're missing a trick here about how to develop this particular point. And I think that that's, you know, definitely problematic. Uh, and then we get on this animal rights issue, and I'm confused. Like I said, I'm completely confused. So, do zoos provide animal rights, or are they violating animal rights? I thought that the affirmative was saying they're violating animal rights, and you seem to be saying, well, because they're preserving the animals, that you know, uh, preserves their rights. Uh, you know and all the koala cam and the ape cam and all that stuff, I'm going, well, how does that have anything to do with this issue? It just seems like, again, like random information that's going on here. So you've got some stuff that you present very forcefully, but I'm not sure where it's all going in the end. It it's, doesn't seem like it's building much of an argument. It just seems like it's a random concept. Then we get to the rebuttals, and everything just seems to be just... Nobody is focusing on what the point of the argument is at the end. At the end of the debate, why do you want to get rid of zoos, and why are they wrong? That's what, that's what we should be listening to. Zoos fail to provide the services that they're supposed to provide. They uh, end up brutalizing animals and shortening their lives, and they put us at risk. And everything that we've talked about about those issues, that's why those things are still, here's why those things are still true. You know, getting stuck on some of this picayune stuff about, uh, you know, how much it costs to feed the animals or uh, whether or not the, you know, PETA said X or Y or, you know, who's more credible in a particular situation. That's less meaningful than the, the bigger picture argument. And your argument needs to be, Zoos provide an important service, and if we lose them, we're going to lose the benefit of those services. And that what they're saying is, is not really an accurate description of what's going on. But uh, you, you've heard the old saying, you can't see the forest for the trees. That's a little bit what we're getting here. Sometimes I think you guys are all looking at the minutia of your arguments instead of remembering what the big picture on some of these points is. And that, I think, is a little bit problematic. What's that? What's a minutia? The small things. The small things, okay. The tiny little things that make up the, the whole of the picture. All right, so if you look at a Monet, you know, it's uh, dots that Monet is painting with. Yeah. Uh, when you're, okay, when you refute somebody, so they go and then we go, 
What's the point of refuting, though, if you don't pick on issues that they set? Because you're saying we're looking But at what's the value of picking on that issue? So, so you make an argument about, you know, 400, we feed them 400 pounds of meat every day. Why does that matter? What's the importance of that argument? I'm not saying not to refute arguments. I'm saying, but you have to tell me what that means. Why is it, why is it an important argument? At the, end of the, at the end of the debate, how am I supposed to use that information in making an assessment? And, and it comes down to, I think in this situation, I think your argument was kind of like it's costly. Look, zoos are costly to maintain. We've got to spend a lot of money on it. Uh, if the animals were in the wild, they would be taking care of themselves and we wouldn't have to worry about this as much. By the way, nature preserves are not free. You know, and, and, and you know, the idea that the animal environment is going to be managed in some way. See, that's to me the kind of argument that you would make. If you're looking at the big picture, you say, so we got all these animals, we're moving them to natural preserves. They still have to be fed. Somebody still has to take care of them. We still have to make sure that they are separated from each other. Otherwise, the lions are going to eat the frickin' elephants. You know, you're worried about giraffes dying in the zoo. What do you think is going to happen to them when we put them in the nature preserve with the leopards? You know, they're going to die there. Or they have to be maintained, which responds to the cost issue. So if it's a cost issue, then let's talk about the cost issue. But instead, we're just arguing, like I said, picayune things instead of what do those picayune things prove? How do they fit into the argument? So, I, like I said, I thought you had a pretty good start on it. I think you've got a lot of the right issues involved here, but they need to be kind of honed a little bit. I know it's your first debate, so it's, you know, it's a little bit tough. You know, I, I thought I thought you guys started off right, and then it you know didn't develop as well as it could have. And I think you guys found the right issues, but they're so randomized that, and at the end, it's like you're you're just throwing punches in the dark and and missing connecting with issues because you haven't thought about what all of it means. There's a reason that you're making those arguments, but you have to come back to why you're making those arguments. The, here's a good example, the disease argument. What does that get you in the long run? I, let's, why is it in the affirmative in the first place that animals carry diseases? Well, when they come back and say, well, animals would have diseases in the wild too, I'm going, okay, yeah, that's true. Your arg I think your argument ultimately is that people might be exposed to diseases when they visit zoos and there would be some problem. But you don't have any proof on that, so if you're not gonna be able to develop that, why is, it in, why is it something to present? That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. You've got an argument, you, because you've got evidence, you said, I'm gonna use this evidence, but what does it get you? And that's one of the problems that happens. You have to think about what it is you're using the information for. All right. You guys have anything else that you wanna ask me or something that you wanna talk about? No, you just want to be done. Yeah.